I'm Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. Welcome. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us. This morning, we are going to be in two books of the Bible. We'll be in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and then we'll also be looking at a passage from the Gospel of Luke, which is the second book in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep if you have that need. Please consider it a gift from us to you. Before we uh, begin, let's uh, take a minute and pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege that is ours to gather in your house, to worship your son Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray now as we turn our attention to your word that you would come, just as you promised, to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A few years after I first became a Christ follower, I began to sense that something wasn't quite right. I, I, I had this uh, feeling that I was missing out on something, somehow, some way. And, and, and those feelings were only uh, exacerbated when I would look at the lives of some other believers around me. I began to notice that there were certain men and women who had a certain quality, a, a depth to their faith, a joy, a peace, a sense of hope and purpose that I seem to be missing in my life. And, and these were people that I knew, people that I trusted, people that I could actually verify, yes, that there is substance to their faith, but for some reason, it's missing in mine. About that time, I came across a, a passage in the Gospel of John, John 10.10, 10, where Jesus makes a startling statement. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, abundantly. In other words, Jesus is saying, I, I came that you might have life and know it in the way that I intended you to know it, not in your brokenness, not in your sin, but that you might know the fullness of what it means to love and to know God, to love and to know me and to walk and live in that fullness with joy, with the, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all these sorts of things. I looked at that passage and I looked at my own life and I began to see there's some disparity there. I, I, I don't have all of these things that Jesus is talking about in the abundant life. I knew better than to think that the abundant life had anything to do with material possessions or wealth. That's what kooky preachers on TV talked about. And neither did I think that the abundant life had anything to do with uh, any, any sort of special protection from suffering for Christians just because we're Christians. I'd seen enough suffering in the lives of genuine believers that I I wasn't going down that path, but I knew that I was missing out on something, but I didn't know exactly what. Well, looking back on that stage in my life, some 30 years later, I think I see things a bit more clearly. And what I see is that I was living a performance-based life. I had set myself on this treadmill of performance, of trying to please God, to curry his favor, to somehow validate my existence, to prove to myself and hopefully to God that I was a worthwhile human being, that he was not wasting his love on me. About the only thing that was abundant in my life at that point was the sense that I was somehow not good enough. And this performance-based approach to life was not only impacting my perspective and my relationship with God, it was impacting all of my relationships, my relationships with other people as well. 
because I didn't have the peace of Christ in my heart, because I didn't know the abundant life that he was offering us, I was under this compulsion to somehow kind of earn it, to somehow get it by proving to others I was a worthwhile human being, by seeking their validation and their approval. And, you know, I I look back on some of the things that I did during those years, and my goodness alive, I, I could be a regular chameleon. You know, if I was in this setting with this group, and I needed to be this way to get their approval, boom, I could be that way. But then if I was over here with this group, and needed to behave another way to get their approval, boom, I could do do that. There wasn't any sort of consistency in my life. I wasn't secure in my foundation, in my life with Christ. I look back with regret on the people that I used along the way, trying to get where I wanted to go, trying to get what I wanted to get, entering into relationships with them, not because I cared about them or loved them, or wanted to bless them, but no, for what they could do for me. I went after things, vain achievements, accomplishments, and so forth, not so that I could make myself a better person, not so that I would be better equipped to serve and love others, but so that people would notice, hey, look what I achieved. Look what I accomplished. This performance-based life was running me ragged, wearing me out, doing whatever I had to do to make sure that God loved me and that other people loved me. But more often than not, I wasn't a happy person. I didn't know anything of the abundant life that Jesus had promised. Oh, I might feel good for a day or two when I got that hit of of validation, of approval, But that only lasted a day or two. And then my heart would be filled with resentment, uh, overly sensitive to criticism, angry. And though I didn't know it at the time, that was all coming from the inner knowledge that I was going to have to get right back on that treadmill again. It was a lonely place to be. I didn't doubt my salvation, I didn't doubt the truth of the gospel. But there can be no doubt that I was not experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus wanted us, wants us to have. It was a lonely place, but I can see now that I was by no means alone. Everyone, to some degree, struggles with this inner desire for validation, for approval. And that treadmill beckons us almost daily. We live in a approval culture. We live in a culture that says, make this amount of money. Wear these kinds of clothes. Get this many likes on Facebook. Hang out with the right groups of people. Live in the right house, the right neighborhood. Drive the right kind of car. If you meet all of these expectations, well, then you're probably a worthwhile human being. And we run after things and run after things and run after things. And all the while we're wearing ourselves out. Even Christians, even in the body of Christ, we are by no means immune to this pursuit of value and self-worth and validation. And so as I, I, I see this, not only in the culture at large, but even in the body of Christ and even in my own life, Still, the temptation is ever present there to want to be approved, to want to be liked. I ask myself about Jesus. Did, did he overpromise and underdeliver when he was talking about the abundant life? I mean, can he really provide that for us? We all seem so hell bent on living otherwise. Is that really a part of what it means to follow Christ? Well, I can assure you that the man who rose from the dead delivers on his promises. And if anybody has the problem in the whole situation, it's not him, it's us. 
There's something within us that prevents us. There is this gap, if you will, between who we are and who Jesus is calling us to be. What our real life experience is and what Jesus holds out to us. On the one hand, you might say, we live in the real, but we yearn for the ideal. The real is the way things are, the true status of situations. The ideal is the abundant life that Jesus promises us. And there is this expanse, this gap between the two. And the thing that fills that gap, the thing that prevents most of us from entering in to the abundant life that Jesus has for us is this dreadful thing called shame. Shame. Now, I'm not talking about temporary embarrassment or a sense of regret over having said something stupid or done something that we wish they hadn't done. No, I'm talking about something much, much more deep seated. It goes beyond a fear of failure. It isn't so much concerned with what we do as it is with who we are as human beings. We often forget that God did not create us as human doings. He created us as human beings. And so if the enemy is going to strike at any area of our life, it's going to be at our fundamental existence, who we are at the most basic level. And unfortunately, who we are at the most basic level is someone that most of us don't particularly like. And we find that it is impacting all of our relationships. We don't have a strong relationship with God because, my goodness alive, how could he love someone as awful as me? Somebody who messes up with such regularity as I do. We find it difficult to be in transparent, loving, honest, intimate relationships with others because we pull off the mask and let them see who we really are, they might not like what they see. And so we step back into isolation and into fear. And this thing called shame drives and dominates too much of our lives. I'm not suggesting that all of us walk around with our head hung low, feeling lousy every single minute of the day. That That's not what I'm talking about, but I am talking about this inner sense that somehow I'm not good enough. That's what I want to talk about today. This problem that we all share, this problem of shame. And I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I learned three very important biblical truths about shame from a friend of mine, a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Paul Looney. Now, there's a psychiatrist name for you, huh? <laughs> Looney. He's actually a very good psychiatrist and a wonderful friend and uh, has unusual insight into the Word of God. And in our friendship and in my visits with him as a patient, I have come to learn so many good things um, about myself and about God and about the relationship that I have with Him. And among those things that I've learned are these three truths that I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about shame. Where did it come from? What has Jesus done about it? And how can we appropriate what Jesus has done into our everyday lives? Uh, For far too many of us, biblical truth is conceptual, theoretical. It's just this stuff that's out there. But I want to get past that, and I want to talk this morning about how we can take biblical truth and make it real 
make it a part of our everyday living and begin to see change, move from a shame-based life to a life of abundance. So where did this thing called shame come from? Well, unfortunately, it's been with us from the very, very beginning. You'll recall that when God created Adam and Eve, they initially lived in an environment of perfection, of innocence, of complete unconditional love and trust with God and with each other. There was no shame. They had nothing to be ashamed about. There was no sin. There was no brokenness. The writer of Genesis explicitly says they were naked and not ashamed. And that's not only a reference to their physical appearance, it's also cluing us in to their emotional, relational, and spiritual existence. They were not ashamed to be in the presence of God. They were not ashamed to be in the presence of each other because they had nothing to hide. It was innocence. It was perfection. And God made clear to them the only thing they had to do to maintain that existence was to remain obedient to Him. And He gave them one command, just one. Don't partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The rest of the garden is yours to enjoy, but stay away from that. As their creator, God knew what was best. And as long as they trusted him and trusted what he said, all went well. But unfortunately, the day came that Adam and Eve decided they knew best themselves. And they did partake of the fruit. And in that moment, shame became a part of of the human experience. Their relationship with God was broken and changed. Their relationship with each other was broken and changed. We read about it in Genesis chapter 3. I'll pick up reading in verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, "'Where are you?' He answered, "'I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid.' And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. In that moment of asserting the self, of putting oneself above God, stepping into sin, all was broken and all was shattered. And what was previously complete harmony and trust and unconditional love now is fear and guilt and shame. And we see in this brief passage a pattern, a pattern of behavior in Adam and Eve that continues right down to this very day. And the pattern begins with a cover-up. They eat the fruit and boom, we're naked. (laughs) Find some fig leaves, quickly. Deep inner sense of shame comes over them. My eyes are open. Your eyes are open. You're not going to like who I am. You're not going to like what you see. I need to hide myself. We do the same thing today. Now, granted, fig leaves are not <clears throat> the typical response. But any time that we put forth a front an image of ourselves that is intended to present ourselves slightly better than we really are, an improved, a new and improved version of who we are, any attempt that we uh, 
engage in to have people think better of us because we don't trust that they will love the real us, we are covering up. And it can range from striving and yearning to achieve uh, wonderful and great things in education, in the corporate world, all the way down to just dropping little tidbits of information about ourselves that, uh, hey, if you didn't know, perhaps this would impress you if you were aware of this particular truth about me and everything in between. But God was not too impressed with their cover-up. And so they went from covering up to hiding out. Now, I am convinced that Adam led the way here because hiding out is a typical male maneuver. I mean, where do you think we got man caves? When the things that our spouse is asking from us are more than we can deliver, when the pressures of work become more than we can handle, when we have feelings and don't know what to do with them, we don't even have the capacity to identify them, let's run. It's always easier to run than to face up to whatever is in front of us to the difficulty of relationships with God and with those around us. It is so much easier to run and hide. But God didn't go for that either. As a matter of fact, he went looking for them. And when he found them, he confronts Adam and wants to know, what have you done? And Adam begins that time-honored tradition of blaming someone else. And he's masterful at it. It was that woman that you gave me. That's why we're in trouble here, the two of you. Never mind that just a few moments ago, all was just hunky-dory between the three of them suddenly now. And that's how we are when we get backed into a corner. We are loath to take responsibility for our failures. It just crawls all over us to have to own up to the fact that I did it wrong, I let you down, I'm sorry, I failed. And it's in those moments that we come out swinging or perhaps pointing. It's their fault. That's why it happened. God's not impressed. So he turns to Eve. What have you done? And Eve takes on the role of the victim. Well, it was the serpent. I was deceived. I was innocent. I didn't know better. How can you expect so much of me? If these don't work out, that one's always left over. I just couldn't help it. It was bigger than me. Poor little old me. Can't deal with it. Can't handle it. But God doesn't accept any of these. He doesn't even acknowledge any of them as you read the story. Why? Because there are two things that God wants us to know. Number one, He wants us to know that we are completely incapable of dealing with our problems, particularly the problem of shame. We don't have the capacity to solve it, and He wants us to know that. More importantly, though, secondly, God wants us to know that He is capable of dealing with it. Not only is he capable, but he wants to deal with it, and he did deal with it. God wants us to understand that shame carries with it an astronomically high price tag. But it was a price that he was willing to pay. And he paid it when he sent his son Jesus to die for you and me on a cross. And Jesus, in effect, yes, yeah, celebrate that. <laughs> that was not planned, by the way. That was purely spontaneous. 
But in effect, Jesus reversed every foolish thing that Adam and Eve tried to do. There was no attempt to cover up on Jesus' part. No, when he went to the cross, he was naked. Part of the humiliation of dying on a cross was to be stripped of your clothes. And with his hands nailed to the tree, there was no way for Jesus to cover himself up. He had nothing to be ashamed of, but he wanted the world to see the ugliness of sin. There's nothing pretty at all about sin. And the results are terrible. Shameful. But the book of Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. He scorned the shame of the cross. And he endured it for the joy set before him. Do you know what the joy set before Jesus was? You and me. For you and for me, he endured the embarrassment of the cross. You know, crosses were intended to be a public spectacle. The Romans were no dummies. The way they controlled thousands and thousands of miles of the Roman Empire was to remind people with strong visuals, if you step out of line, there will be a price to pay. And none was more effective than a cross. And crosses were always put up and displayed in highly visible locations. In Jerusalem, scholars and historians have narrowed it down to about two possible locations where Jesus was probably crucified. I've been there a couple of times, and it is easy to see why either one of these would have been an option because they're both elevated, visible from all around. You can see why that would have been an optimal spot to make a spectacle of someone. By the way, I would say I'm, I'm going back there in February, end of February, beginning of March, leading a tour there. If any of you would be interested in going with me, I'll be out in the West Atrium when the service is over. I'd love to talk to you. But Jesus hung there, not only naked, but for all to see. And he didn't blame anybody. What did he say? Father, forgive them. You know, Adam and Eve had no good reason to sin, but they did. Jesus had every reason in the world to disobey God, but he didn't. Even though he knew the cross and intense suffering and death was looming, still he hung there taking responsibility for you and for me because we would not take it for ourselves. And in that moment, he casts no blame, no aspersions on anyone. He simply says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And Jesus was no victim. No, Jesus was a willing sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross of his own accord. He was not trapped. He was not pushed into it. It wasn't the Romans who crucified Jesus. It wasn't the Jews who crucified Jesus. Jesus went to the cross out of his own desire to demonstrate his great eternal love for you and for me. He said so. I lay down my life of my own choosing. No victim, no, a willingness to die for you and for me. He, in effect, reversed all of the horrible pattern that Adam and Eve had set for us. And not only did he do that, but he also taught us how we can take what he did for us and make it a part of our everyday lives. And he taught us how to do that with a particular story found in Luke chapter 15. It's commonly known as the story of the prodigal son. 
If you're not familiar with it, I'll give you a little background. There was a young man who decided one day that he had had enough of living at home. And in the most disrespectful, rude, dishonoring way, he went to his father and said, I want my inheritance now. In other words, dad, you're dead to me and I'm sick of living here, so give me mine. And the father gave it to him. And the scriptures say that he went off to a distant land and spent every single penny in wild living until one day it was all gone. And he discovered for himself that when the money is gone, the friends are gone. And he found himself all alone in the worst possible place for a Jew in a hog pen, eating the slop with the hogs. Picking up in verse 17, as he's there in the mud and the slop, he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Jesus taught us that if we want to appropriate what he has done for us, we've got to do like the sun and get up. I will arise, he said. He came to his senses. He realized, you know what? There are some things that only God can do and there are some things that only I can do. God is not going to come down and get you in a headlock and make you receive his grace. You've got to stand up and decide by his grace that you want it, that you want the abundant life that he offers. Just as the son first had to stand up and decide, I'm sick of living with the pigs. I'm ready to go home. From there he showed up. I will arise and I will go to my father. It had to be the most humbling, embarrassing moment of his life to go back to the man that he had insulted and disrespected in the worst possible way and beg for mercy. But what were his options? To die with the pigs? Or to live with humility? How many of us are being held back because of our pride? A little bit of humility brings eternal life. But a little bit of pride robs us of eternal life. Perhaps today is your day to show up. Perhaps the reason you're here is because God's ready to do business with you. And you're finally awakening to the fact that it's my turn and it's my time. Instead of blaming anybody else, the son chose to own up. Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. He took responsibility. And that is when the healing began. There is healing in confession. Why? Why? Because confession communicates to God, I understand what I've done. I understand the seriousness of my rebellion. I understand that I can't do anything about it, but you can. And I'm putting my trust in you. That's the kind of thing that God is drawn toward. And that's when the healing begins. When we acknowledge that God is right and that we're not. 
He got up. He showed up. He owned up. And then finally, you could say he decided to re-up. Make me one of your servants. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he was exactly right. By rights, all he deserved was to be a servant because he had disinherited himself from the family, proclaimed that his father was dead. But he took a huge step of faith. And he went before his father and he basically said, I know I don't deserve it, Dad, but I'm coming back. And to whatever degree you'll have me as a part of this family, I want to be a part of it. And his dad said, get up. You're not my slave. You're my son. We're going to kill the fatted calf. And I'm going to put a ring on your finger and a robe on your back because once you were lost, but now you're found. Once you were dead, and now you're alive. Friends, God is calling us to life. And he's dealt with the problem. All he's waiting on is for us to step up and acknowledge, yeah, I've got the problem, and I can't do anything about it. But I believe that you can. And I'm asking you today, take my shame and give me life. That's what God wants for us today. And so we're going to close the service by spending a little bit of time in prayer and asking him to make that exchange. We're going to have some prayer partners down here at the front. If you need to come forward and pray, you're certainly welcome to do that. But let's give God an opportunity to do what only God can do. Will you stand with me as we pray? Father, we confess to you that far too often we just go our own way. We think we know what's best. And in our foolish pride, we find ourselves shackled with shame. We're crying out to you today, oh God, forgive us, deliver us, give to us the abundant life that only you can provide. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who's struggling, whose self-esteem is in the ditch, who doubts their worth and their value. Lord, would you show up and reveal to them just how beautiful and valuable they are, valuable enough that your son would die on their behalf. Seal this truth to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.